Good morning. It's Monday, the 29th of May, and I'm Govind Raj Ethiraj with the core report coming to you from Mumbai, India's financial capital and most rocking city in the world. Here are our two quick reports and theme of the day, the hmm section and conversation where we try and divine what the monsoon could or could not do if it decides to take some detours along the way. Also, BJP showcases its track record of the last nine years and throws some hints on what the 2024 election plan could be. Second, Mahindra and Mahindra posts record turnover and profits a month after its chairman emeritus passes away. And hmm, a financial influencer gets wrapped on the knuckles by the stock market regulator, a sign that the Wild West days of influencing are ending. This is a core report with Govindraj Ethiraj. The nine years of the BJP. I had the opportunity to attend a presentation made by and in the presence of senior BJP ministers and leaders on Friday in New Delhi's Ashoka Hotel last week. The presentation was on the nine years of BJP's rule. Being a party presentation, it was expected to focus on the positives and also highlight the political and administrative clout of Prime Minister Narendra Modi in the thinking and execution of the many programs. The presentation was made by Ashwini Vaishnav, who runs the Railways, Communication, Electronics and Information Technology Ministries. Now, he is new to the cabinet and sounded energetic, enduring and perhaps mildly professorial as he paced up and down the brightly lit stage with a dominating wall-to-wall LED screen behind him, flashing images and data during his presentation. He even made concerted attempts to engage the audience at various points. For instance, he asked if anyone had travelled in a Vande Bharat train and what they thought of it. Not that that question would have elicited a negative response in this particular room, but the consensus among others I have spoken to is quite positive. This particular audience comprised a fair number of folks from the finance world in Mumbai, to which I think I was clubbed in, some people from the social media world, and some journalists who I could spot from mostly overseas media organisations. Now, I was principally trying to understand three things, all through an economic and business lens. One, what achievements is the BJP projecting? Two, how do these achievements stack up over time? And three, what is the BJP's thinking going forward and likely plank for the 2024 elections? The pitch largely seemed like an attempt to draw a comparison between the 10 years of the previous Manmohan Singh-led United Progressive Alliance or UPA government versus the nine years of the Narendra Modi government. Going into each individual data point could be tedious, so let me bunch up the listed achievements in the following manner. There is no fact-checking here, let me confess as such, because my sense is that most numbers stand or at best or worst may be contextually off a little here and there. So before I do that, there are two very critical threads which link most of these developments and investments. The first is what I would call the digital thread, including the famous India stack and the payments and so on. And the second is the physical thread, which includes the massive investments in roads, railways, highways, airports and inland waterways. Now, these two threads run through many or most of the other investments that have happened, which create or strengthen strong long term linkages. Many countries, as you know, have surpassed India on the physical thread, but we are in step on the digital thread. This also finds reflection in the composition of our economy, which is largely services driven. Now, to come back to citizens, particularly those in the underprivileged sections, the National Free Food Grain Program is now touching 800 million people or a substantial part of the population. This provided some degree of support and a net during and after COVID. Citizens have also benefited from banking access via 490 million Jandhan or no frill accounts And linked to that is some 29 lakh crore rupees of direct benefit transfers. They have also benefited from insurance schemes like an accident insurance scheme, Suraksha Bhima Yojana, touching 337 million people, a health insurance scheme, Ayushman Bharat, which is now 390 million people, direct tap water connections, 112 million telemedical consultations, and 30 million houses with another 10 million to come under the PM Awas Yojana. Connecting many of the schemes above are small payments processes which allow foolproof transfers from government to citizens or the other way around, like in payment of local level dues or even toll road payments which are considerably automated thanks to the fast tag system which is now doing around 193 crore rupees a day. The UPI is about 53% of digital transactions which obviously enables individual commerce, peer-to-peer payments as well as business commerce. Now, on the business side, perhaps there are three things that stand out. 
The first is the goods and services tax or GST, which hit a record collection last month of 187,000 crores. Lower corporate income taxes at 15% versus 25% earlier and the insolvency and bankruptcy code. The BJP also said some 1,500 archaic laws have been repealed and some 39,000 compliances have been scrapped. Now, this is very likely, but I'm not sure there is a measure of what new ones have come up, either afresh or as addendums. Just in the last two weeks, for instance, there have been new compliances, including a presumptive tax for overseas credit card spends overseas. And I'm going to come back to that in a moment. The good news is that lower taxes have helped companies shore up their bottom lines and made India more competitive internationally, as has GST in reorganizing and making more efficient the flow of goods across the country. While GST is in principle a great reform, working with it, particularly for small businesses or even large, has become increasingly complex in every passing year. The government's Make in India thrust and incentives for domestic production is paying some small dividends, though Indian entrepreneurs and businesses have also demonstrated, unfortunately, that they can't be fully trusted to be honest in their business actions, at least in this area. Now to the physical infrastructure bit. The number of airports have gone from 74 to 148 in nine years. There are 328,000 kilometers of rural roads and highway building is now claimed at 37 kilometers a day. There are 400 Vande Bharat trains lined up, of which 16 are operational, and 111 waterways have been declared as national waterways. Metro trains run through many more cities now, though they have or are taking much longer than originally envisaged to come into full operation. Mumbai, where I live, is a classic case. Also, it's frustrating to see an arterial bridge in the city take over five years to get rebuilt. That's Lower Parel in central Mumbai, if you wanted to know. And it's still not ready, while a 1,000-kilometer expressway has been built in three years. India has been doing well on its green push, whether in investments in renewables like the world's largest solar park, solar energy capacity, solarizing of agriculture pumps, or the distribution of 370 million LED bulbs to save electricity, and finally, going after single-use plastic. Now, if you were to add state and central government efforts, they might add up to even more, but in many cases have also fallen short of citizen and business expectations. There was not much, by the way, of projections in that presentation, as most of it was looking back. The government has, however, stated its ambitions looking ahead elsewhere, like the goal of attaining a developed country status by 2047, for which per capita income has to grow, according to columnist T.N. Nainan, fivefold in 24 years. Looking ahead and coming back to the questions I posed in the beginning. Looking back for individuals, the accessible benefits are higher for sure. And the digital threads have enabled rapid rollout of several initiatives like that critical vaccine program where over 2 billion doses were administered efficiently. For individuals, again, there is a higher tax-free income at the lower end and life potentially made easier through facilities like the DigiLocker, which electronically stores your data like Aadhaar or PAN card on your smartphone and is accepted anywhere. On the flip side, rising inflation, high cost of living and low job creation will increase the pressure on welfare measures. So at least for now, to conclude, the BJP seems to be leaning towards a largely pro-welfare plank for 2024 with some cultural religious thrusts here and there, like the construction of a brand new Ayodhya temple. The cultural thrusts could, of course, intensify depending on how the economy is looking next summer. The attempt, I think, would be to compare the 10 years by then with the previous 10 and suggest that life has changed considerably for the better. There will be much emphasis, justifiably to some extent, on the empowering of the individual citizen and consumer, including women. On the business side, ease of business is being touted, but that is a tougher sell in my view as business tends to go by what they experience and not what they hear. Though experiences will differ depending on whether you're old or new economy. It is not clear whether in this part, whether we will be a more open economy in coming years. All signals, including the steady raising of tariffs in recent years, suggest that we will not. That may not be the best prescription, but the 2024 election season has now formally begun. Finally, among the few ministerial encounters I could swing after the presentation, one was with Finance Minister Nirmala Sitaraman for a few minutes. I thought I would ask her about that 2,000 rupee note, but felt she might lob that ball into the Reserve Bank's court. So I asked instead about the 20% presumptive tax on international credit card spends. Her answers are, I'm guessing, off the record, so I won't replay them. She did ask me if I knew what China's overseas investment limits were in contrast to our $250,000 per person per year. 
No, I said. Fifty thousand dollars was her response. Sometime in early 2002, auto journalist Horma Surabji and I were driving to Nasik, roughly four hours from Mumbai, on some fairly dusty roads, if I remember correctly. We were on our way to get a sneak preview and test drive of the to-be-launched Scorpio at the Mahindra and Mahindra plant in Nasik. We were also most likely the first journalist to get a sneak peek at this amazing creation. The Scorpio at that time was amongst the first fully indigenous Indian four-wheelers to grace Indian roads. Tata's Indica had been launched as a hatchback in 1998 with a diesel engine, but Scorpio was a SUV and the brainchild of Pawan Goenka when he started in 1996-97 with a small team. Till then, M&M was making Jeeps, a popular brand called Commander was one, and tractors. Jeeps, of course, go back to M&M's origins in 1947 with Willys, which they began assembling in India. Goenka started with an outlay of 550 crore rupees, lower than what he originally asked for, which was 800 crore rupees, and way lower than what it would cost to launch a new four-wheeler from scratch. Which brings me to the present. M&M must be amongst the few companies in the world to be a significant player in farm equipment and automobiles. Perhaps the only thing common to both is four wheels and an internal combustion engine, at least for now. Mumbai headquartered M&M also declared record sales and record net profits for the year ended 22-23, which is March 31st, 2023. Now, records are not new for M&M as it is referred to because it has been growing in top line and bottom line steadily. But the size and scale I felt merit some attention, more so coming on the heels of the demise of its chairman emeritus Keshab Mahindra just last month at the age of 99. A quick aside, Keshab Mahindra was born in 1923, graduated from Wharton in 1947 and joined the company founded by his father KC Mahindra and uncle JC Mahindra and then ran it from 1963 as chairman till 2012. Perhaps one of the longest stints at least for a company of this size. It was only in 2012 that Anand Mahindra took over the company as chairman. Now for the last financial year M&M posted consolidated net profits of 10282 crore up 56% on a turnover of 1.2 lakh crore rupees up 34% both records. This includes of course revenue from other segments like financial services. M&M's automotive segment which sees bitter competition against several Indian, Japanese, European and Korean auto majors saw sales at 698,000 while its farm equipment sector saw sales of 404,000 units up 15%. Now M&M says it has an outstanding order book of around 300,000 units so that's roughly half of last year's sales with waiting periods of over a year on some popular models. Cancellation rates are at around 8% the company says. Incidentally, a friend of mine got a committed delivery date for September 9th for a Mahindra XUV 700 AX7 a few months ago. The only problem was the year was 2099. Let me repeat that, 2099. And I'm not joking because I saw the letter he got and I asked him to show it to me again yesterday. After debating whether this was an error or to will it to in his words his great great grandchildren, he sought a refund belonging to the deprived 8%, I would imagine. By the way, despite being a record setting year in turnover and profits, M&M disappointed analyst estimates for the fourth quarter because net profit was 1549 crore rupees up 22% analysts expected much more. On to rains and the economy. Thirty-six years ago, British travel writer Alexander Freighter traversed the length and breadth of India, or more like length, around this time of the year to write his seminal travelogue, Chasing the Monsoon: A Modern Pilgrimage Through India. Freighter catches the monsoon in Kerala as it hits in the first week of June, and then travels with it across the country. He captures quite brilliantly in the book the intrigue behind the onset of the monsoon, the anticipation across the country, particularly amongst the political class. and the sheer importance of timely and well scattered rains to india's largely then agricultural economy as the first week of june 2023 approaches some things have changed but then not much except perhaps more uncertainty though we've had seven straight normal monsoons the first uncertainty is el nino a weather phenomenon that is likely to affect patterns in the latter half of the monsoon season and then of course there's the question of extreme weather Poor monsoons do not play havoc on the economy like in Freighter's time, but they can have an impact nevertheless. To understand what has changed and not, even as we wait 
for the first trains to hit the Kerala coast on June 4th, which is three days late, by the way. And what we should be watching out for, I caught up with Bank of Baroda Chief Economist Madan Sabnavis and began by asking him to define the importance of monsoons at this point. You know, notwithstanding everything that has been done in agriculture in order to increase overall output, that is through better productivity and more area under cultivation, what we have realized is that still around 60 to 70 percent of uh, the kharif harvest is dependent upon the monsoon. So what this really means is that around 30 to 40 percent of uh, the area under cultivation does have access to good irrigation facilities, which means that if you're not in the northern states that is along the Gangetic Belt, it's more likely that uh, that particular region is dependent on the monsoon. And hence, it's critical that uh, monsoon should be normal. Now, even when we say that the monsoon should be normal, we should remember that overall headline number may not mean too much. It's a good statistic stick to have, but I think what's important is how it is distributed across different regions. Specifically, if you're talking of the Kharif crop, I would say that regions like Madhya Pradesh, Chhattisgarh, Karnataka, Andhra Pradesh, Telangana, large part of Rajasthan, they are actually dependent a lot on the monsoon. And the crops which are grown out here, primarily, let's say, coarse cereals, cotton, pulses, oil seeds, are the ones which are vulnerable to the monsoon effects. If I look at the northern states, which are the ones which are growing rice, which is the major kharif crop, they do normally have access to irrigation and uh, they're not affected so much by a subnormal monsoon. So I think in this overall scenario where we are talking of a slowdown in the Indian economy, maybe to the region of around six to six and a half percent this year, which will still make India probably the fastest growing large economy. It is contingent on agriculture performing, that is agriculture growing around three and a half to four percent, which in turn also means that the Kharif crop, which accounts for around 50 percent of overall agricultural output, should be receiving a normal monsoon. Right. So between agriculture livelihoods and agriculture output, how would you weight the two? In fact, both of them are very important uh, because when I'm talking of agricultural uh, output, I think that is what is added to uh, overall GDP. And this is also something which has a bearing on food inflation. So I think that's why from the point of view of output, it is important. But from the point of view of livelihood, I think it's the income which matters. That is, the output needs to be normal so that the farmer's income keeps increasing. And if the farmer's income increases, that will actually contribute to overall rural demand. Now, we have seen a number of manufacturing companies already state that they are quite unsure about how rural demand had fared last year. So for this particular year, that is when we have the harvest, which will be in the months of September onwards, primarily in October and November, Uh, which is also the festival season, when we talk of rural demand contributing to the overall demand of manufactured products, this is where it's important. So agricultural harvest adds to GDP and also from the income side, it provides uh, livelihood in terms of income, which is spent on non-agricultural products. Therefore, there is a dual importance for this particular sector. Right. And, you know, we've been talking about El Nino. Now, that obviously causes variations in monsoons or weather conditions. And we're also at the same time now geared up for or gearing up for extreme weather conditions. How do you as an economist look at this? See, both of them are uh, important. When I say both of them are important, because El Nino generally tells us that in general, the monsoon could be weaker. How weak, of course, is something which we go by the guidance given by IMD, which says that things are not going to be that bad. Of course, I think SkyMet had earlier uh, projected that there could be some problems in terms of overall monsoon, but we will have to wait and see what happens. Essentially, when we talk of an El Nino, it means that the monsoon will be weaker than normal. And we have seen in the past that uh, we have had major El Nino incidents as well as not so severe. When it's not so severe, we have seen that overall agricultural production has not been affected that adversely. But when we have a major event like we had in 2016, I think, 15, 16, that's the time when we do see that monsoon is uh, below normal and that is something which uh, affects the crops. Right. And uh, last question. So how's your outlook for the rest of the year if we were to put monsoons aside for a moment? See, actually, even on the monsoons, I think the other issue which you had raised was on extreme heat conditions. So I think extreme heat conditions, late departure of the monsoon, these are also important factors which we have to take into account. Because when we have extreme heat conditions, it tends to damage the crop at the time of harvest. 
And similarly, even when we're talking in terms of uh, late withdrawal of the monsoon, which has been a case in the last couple of years as climatic patterns have changed in India, that has also meant that crops which are at a time of harvest, you see this heavy rainfall, there is a case of crops getting damaged. That seems to be more in the horticulture space. Extreme heat has been affecting the wheat crop. Now, keeping aside these two factors and saying that how is the economy likely to perform? I would tend to believe that it would be rather stable. The reason I feel this is that India is more of a domestic-oriented economy, and we tend to get less affected by global developments. So today, when we're talking of, uh, say, Germany going into a recession, which is the latest data which shows, or the Western economies sort of stagnating, registering low growth rates, while our exports do get affected, but since we are basically a domestic-oriented economy. That strength remains, and that's why we are talking still of six, six and a half percent. But this said, I think we should not get carried away by the number because uh, growth should also be bringing along investment, private investment. It should be creating more jobs. And unfortunately, we have seen the last couple of years. Of course, we have attributed to COVID and its effects. We have not seen private investment pick up. We have not really seen employment of a meaningful nature being generated. Most of the jobs are being created more in the space of construction, delivery boys in the service sector. We're not really seeing the manufacturing sector show the kind of buoyancy which is required. So I think that would be the kind of a qualification to the overall uh, rather stable economic picture which we can present for 23-24. Uh, Madan Sabnav is giving us a wrap on what he expects the monsoons to do or not to the economy, but also pointing out that there are some structural issues that we have to worry about. And the hmm section. A financial influencer or influencer has been asked by the Securities and Exchange Board of India to return advisory fees and disgorge over 6 crore rupees he earned in connection with a case where he apparently offered investment advice without a registration. This is because he chose to settle and compound the offences rather than fight it out. The amount is actually quite large, even if not for the person concerned. The market run of the last few years, accompanied by a growth in social media, has clearly given many articulate people the opportunity to simplify financial matters and then slowly start peddling advice, including on buying cryptocurrencies, sometimes in exchange for a fee. It goes without saying that there was a gap in the market between the hunger for knowledge and the availability of it, at least in the form desired. But this was also a bit of a wild west, which in retrospect, it's a little shocking how big it had become and how easily, in some cases, articulation could pass for knowledge, particularly of the stock markets. The larger lesson, I guess, is that where money and health are concerned, at least, regulators need to step in very actively and start laying down rules, as they have begun to, because it's your money and your health that you have to be careful about. That's it for me today. Have a great week ahead and see you tomorrow. This was the core report with me, Govindraj Ethiraj. Do stay connected with more of our coverage at the core. You can check out our website or sign up to our newsletter at www.thecore.in. That is www.thecore.in. Or follow us on LinkedIn, Twitter, and Facebook as well. Now, we would love your feedback on how we can make business more interesting and relevant to you including our reporting on India's vibrant manufacturing sector. Write to us at feedback at the core.in. Thank you for listening. <laughs>